Hello. I am Margaret Anderson. I'm the executive director of Faster Cures. And Faster Cures is a center of the Milken Institute. We were created over 11 years ago out of uh, Mike Milken's interest in trying to understand how do we solve problems that are relevant to all diseases, to the entire system. So our programs are really geared towards trying to make things move more efficiently. And I am really delighted this morning to have the opportunity to further a discussion that we just had a bit of in a private session on precision medicine. Uh, this topic, I think, has some, some similarities. Uh, what we're talking about really is a changing narrative in biomedical research. And for those of you who are not from this space and you came to be educated, don't worry. We're going to keep the conversation at a, at a level that is relevant for everyone, because this conversation is relevant to everyone. And I think if you are coming from other sectors, you have valuable insights that are relevant to this topic of big data and how do we use it to harness uh, you know, the efforts to cure disease. You know, this narrative, I, I mentioned it in the opening plenary, there was some discussion of the narrative of the US, the narrative of Europe. And I said in precision medicine that there, there's been this ongoing narrative that, um, you know, we would have this magical day where we would all have disease treatments that are, you know, tailored to us. I think the same narrative is true around big data in terms of what it can offer. The difference I would posit today is that we're actually starting to see the benefits. And so the panelists that I uh, am excited to have you meet are all different experts from different parts of the ecosystem. So they're going to be talking about their perspectives on big data in the past, where we are today, and then where we need to go collectively. Um, the, the sort of mantra, the, the mantra and the um, ethos of Faster Cures is really to bring all parts of the ecosystem together to have a conversation, and, and that's what we've done today. So I am not going to give long introductions, but I'm going to um, rely on you to have looked at your app and understand who these folks are. Um, I'm going to start with each panelist giving some brief comments about this issue of big data. And then we'll get into an integrated conversation, and hopefully we'll have enough time to get some questions from all of you. So I'm excited to have you here from our first speaker, Mary Baker. Mary is to my left. And Mary and I met about a year ago at a conference, a uh, small meeting that was convened um, at the headquarters of Sanofi in Paris. And it was a sort of a mixture of European disease research and patient advocates and those from the US. And I think. Um, you know, the U.S. is used to thinking that, that we invented everything and all, all roads lead to us. And Mary was a very helpful tutor in understanding that, uh, you know, we live in a big world. Um, Europe has some differences and uh, there's a lot of rich opportunity in that. So it was a real privilege to get a chance to meet her, get to know her work. Uh, and I'm excited for her to talk first about how um, she has seen the, the sort of concept of big data and the usage of data in health and medical evolve, um, but also some broad thematic um, concepts that are going to be relevant to this conversation. So Mary, take it away. Right. Thank you very much for a very nice introduction. Um, right. Well, I feel passionately that health is a very major part of the economy. It's not something separate. Health is wealth. A healthy nation is a wealthy nation. And I think we should stop talking about cost and we should start talking about investment. Um, I think we take a very good mantra that is up at Europe at the moment, introduced by President Juncker, which is excellent science leading to innovation, leading to societal impact, but it must, that societal impact has to go further on now to the outcomes, the reported outcomes of the patients, so that you stop saying that an intervention is expensive. They all are, if you look up this end, but if you look what it can deliver, it may be a very good investment. Now, I think we then need to look at the facts. So please, this is Europe, with respect, just Europe. So um, we tried at the Brain Council to do a costing of what was being spent and we looked at the brain diseases. Obviously, I come from the European Brain Council. Um, and we found that across uh, Europe, this is up to 2014, that 800 billion euros is being spent per year across Europe. That is more than is spent on cancer, plus diabetes, 
plus cardiovascular. It's an enormous amount of money and it is quite unsustainable. The murmurings are really growing in Europe. Now, I am not, not, not making a case for neurology and psychiatry. I am making a case that whatever is wrong with you, it is managed by this organ, keeping the appointments, taking the medicines, understanding. And we have done a little, a little study where we looked at the diabetic patient where when they um, were first diagnosed, they did quite well, they took their medicines, they then um, went, to the, went to the hospitals at the right time. But if they got depressed, if the brain became compromised in any way, then the appointments were missed, the medication became muddled, the secondary symptoms began. And then, of course, you know, the distress mounts for the patient and the family, and the cost to the health system begins to mount. So we need to look at perhaps some of the facts across Europe. We are an aging population, and we should celebrate it. Um, we, the um, estimate coming out of Denmark from one of, one of the um, economists is that of all the people who've ever been on planet Earth and who've made it to 65 years of age, two-thirds of them are on it now. It's an incredible statistic. Two-thirds of us over 65 are on it now. And the big challenge across Europe is comorbidity. How do we manage it? The facts are, the longer you live, the more diseases you acquire. Once you're over 65, certainly three, four diseases moving on you leads to polypharmacy. So um, as I look in the audience, I do see some young people out there. Make the most of it. Um, uh, good health is just an incomplete diagnosis. So, <laughs> so the big push in Europe is prevent, prevention. Prevent the preventable, and if you can't prevent, then prevent the deterioration. New thinking, new looking at this, how we can do this. And we, this is about gathering the big data, uh, which is going on right across Europe. Um, and I, I'm delighted because we did rely on the pharmaceuticals to gather those awful things, those PSURs. When I was at the European Medicines Agency, we tried to look at those for help and information, and they were just non-comprehensible. So it's now the real world data. There's a wonderful opportunity, and it rests on trust. It rests on working together. It rests on how we can, what we're going to gather, why we're going to gather it, and how we're going to standardize it, and, and actually by what, we're under, what we mean by it. I'll pause there. Fantastic. And I hope you'll let me come back in a minute. I, I would love to. So you, I think you see why I asked Mary to go first, because she really brings out a um, sort of a human perspective, a patient perspective, uh, and gives you kind of this macro level look. I want to go next. Um, OK, I asked for some advice on how to say your name, and I've already forgotten it. So my brain function isn't so good right now. Gianrico Ferrugia, uh, who is the vice president of the Mayo Clinic and the CEO of the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And you know, for those not from the States, the Mayo Clinic has a reputation for you know, really excellent, pristine data. And clearly, you're using it in your health systems. But talk about your um, relationship to what Mary just put forward, which is this sort of health equals wealth and um, maybe taking a lifespan approach um, also, you know, where do you see big data going, you know, kind of from this point on? Because it is, I think we're kind of on this um, treadmill, if you will, of trying to understand the utility. And, and we'll talk about some of the case examples as we go forward. Thank you. Mayo Clinic is a not-for-profit. We know that big data is essential to Mayo Clinic. For those of you who don't know us, we're about a $9 billion industry. We uh, employ about 60,000 people. And we focus heavily on research and on education as a way of achieving excellence. And in order to do so, we spend about $900 million a year. We need big data to make sure we're using that money wisely. We focus on clinical excellence, on true value, and on making sure that rather than doing mergers and acquisitions, Mayo Clinic does mostly knowledge dissemination. When we looked at big data and we started investing in big data, what we found, there are four major areas in healthcare that are ripe for big data. The first is comparative effectiveness. When there are different treatments, which one works best? 
The second one is behavior and policy. The third one is regional variations in treatment. And the fourth is uh, treatment response. And I'll give you a very, very brief anecdote there to, to amplify how big big data needs to be in order to get res results. There are currently, when somebody needs a blood thinner for a variety of reasons, for example, in the heart, um, you can use warfarin or you can use some of the newer agents. The newer agents, you don't need to keep testing your blood, but they tend to be more expensive. What we found when we analyzed all our data that whether or not it was advantageous to use one or the other depended on how old you are. At 65, there was a shift, and I'm glad you mentioned 65 as being a, a key year. Uh, in this case, it certainly was. And the only re way we could do that was by using millions and millions of data points. In healthcare, I think we've pretty much not solved, but we know how to deal with the volume part of big data. We know how to do with the, ve the velocity part of big data. It's the veracity part of big data that I think we're going to have to um, continue to invest in. Can you unpack that a little bit more in terms of um, you know, what falls under that category? So of that veracity. we can, yes. So when you look at big data, you can see who owns big data. Well, of course, we all do. But within uh, academic and medical centers, it tends to be under the rubric of public health and it's under the rubric of epidemiologists. And epidemiologists have built a reputation for making sure they want pristine information. You cannot make decisions about healthcare that are going to affect people's lives unless you really clean up that Excel spreadsheet. And that has been a fundamental of research and has led to making sure that the data are really clean and then whatever we do, we base it on randomized controlled trials. With back data, now we come to, a, to the realization that you, although you can clean it, you cannot get it too clean, and that you have to rely on the vastness of the data. That creates now where we are at the moment, which is this nexus between do you rely on a big data to make a clinical decision, or do you rely on big data to provide you with a hypothesis to then test in a randomized controlled trial? And this is something that we haven't resolved yet and that we need to resolve. One way we're doing it at Mayo Clinic is through an initiative um, with United Health Therapeutics called Optum Labs. And in Optum Labs, it's started off with us. Now it includes 20 partners, including Novartis, Merck, AARP, and many others, including Harvard Medical School, where we're combining three data sets that are really important for us. The first are claims. We have about 150 million person claims, about 37 million healthcare records, and importantly, about 38 million consumer records. And when you combine those three together, you can really get to a point where you can use big data to make clinical decisions. Great, thank you. So Nicola, I would like for you to talk next about your work at the Wellcome Trust and perspectives that you have on you know, the, the sort of privacy issues related to this or the public policy issues. Because you know, as we know, um, being consumers in society, I think that there are you know, more implications to the data that we're kind of spreading all around than ever before. I think that there's probably a heightened awareness of it in terms of data breaches around your credit card purchase or what we're posting on various social media streams. I mean, we're talking about our, our health here. So um, give us some perspectives on that and what we think today versus where you see this going and what kind of um, construct do we need to be looking at it? Anthony, thank you very much indeed. So the Wellcome Trust is a global charitable foundation. For those of you who don't know us, we fund about 800 million pounds a year in biomedical research. And so we're hugely excited about the opportunities that big data allows for health, both looking at the health of populations using patient records and the opportunity to ask new research questions by combining data from primary practice from GPs and also from hospital data. So you can look across the whole health history of an individual patient and of patient populations. You can ask questions about groups where it'd be difficult to do clinical trials, for example, pregnant women or with children, and also it provides opportunities for information about small patient populations and particularly rare disease groups. So there are exciting opportunities to 
understand more about the causes of disease and also to monitor the safety and effectiveness of treatments. The work around um, MMR and autism, for example, it was looking at patient records from GP clinics that finally disproved the link between MMR and autism. So they're a hugely valuable research resource, just the usual records about health populations. Um, there are also other research data sets that could have much more value if we can harness the data more effectively. And clinical trial data is one of the obvious examples for that. At the moment, trial data has been sitting with the sponsor or the company that invested in the clinical trial. But if you could link up different clinical trials, you can ask new questions, you can look at new methodologies, you can look at subpatient populations. So we've been doing a lot of work to look at how you can facilitate access to that kind of data. Clinical trial data is, to some extent, an easier set because participants have consented to take part in the trial and they, that consent can include use of their data for further analysis and investigation. And we owe it to the trial participants to make the best possible use of their data so that they didn't just take part in one trial, but that contribution they made is used as much as possible. Patient data from GP records is a much more complicated set of issues, and it depends entirely on public trust. And in the UK, we've seen a, that trust really destroyed over the last few years. The Care.data Data program was launched badly January last year. There wasn't adequate communication. There weren't clear safeguards, and people really didn't understand the benefits and the risks. So if we're going to make the best possible use of that data, we need to rebuild the trust. That means being completely transparent about how people's data can be used and, most importantly, who buy. People are reluctant to have commercial organisations ac accessing their data, even though actually we really need those industries to be able to use the data. Pharma companies developing drugs will rely on the data. But we've got to build a system with the right safeguards, the right governance frameworks, the right access mechanisms, and then talk about it and make sure people can understand and they have the opportunity to opt out. And I think if we can build that trust, then we can maximise the, the opportunities. Because where patients are giving their data, they're hugely supportive of, of further uses. And the opportunities that new health apps give, that an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, if any of you are wearing them, there's a huge amount of data stored there. And the more we can access that data with appropriate safeguards, the more we'll be able to learn. Thank you. Albert, uh, at Pfizer, how are you all looking as a global company you know, to harness the impact of big data but be responsive to what was just put forward in terms of some of the, the potential pitfalls? Um, you know, how do you see yourself as a company kind of navigating that terrain and what do you need out of the sectors represented here to be able to do that successfully? Because I, I often say if, if you as a company, uh, you know, the companies are not successful, we all pay a price for that. We, we want to see that success um, because I think, you know, we talked in the earlier panel um, about oncology and cancer. We don't just want to treat cancer, we would like to see it eradicated and we need to have those building blocks built. Thank you, and uh, actually let me explain first what we do so people can understand the importance of the things that we do and then also talk a little bit about the challenges that we are facing and privacy is one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the Pfizer, first of all, is a major research organization. We are investing $7.5 billion in, uh, in research and uh, the goal is, as you said, not only to find medicines that prolong life but eventually cure, like uh, cancer, for example. And uh, I think that big data is an extremely useful tool for accomplishing our mission. And I have to say that still we are at infancy. And I don't say that to diminish the importance right. of, uh, of uh, big data, actually to emphasize how important they are, because we have already tangible results, although we are still scratching the surface of what can be achieved. And I think there are four major forces that are driving this. And one, of course, is genomic, right? This uh, encoding of, uh, of the mystery of the human genome and these over three billion letters that uh, needs to be in a specific sequence and define what we do. And if something is wrong, then uh, uh, if the sequence is not the right one, then some consequences happen. The second big force 
uh, it is the medical records, the digitization of uh, medical records from years back. And uh, legislation that is coming to what you said is trying to force interoperability, means that uh, those records and the databases can communicate with each other because they are sitting in different places. The third, it is the technology revolution in wearable devices because those generate substantial number of data that uh, can affect or are linked with our health. If we, how we sleep, what is the level of our stress, uh, if we sit or stand, if we move, all of these are detected and stored right now in, on the cloud. And uh, the fourth major driver, uh, it is uh, the social media, believe it or not. Because in social media, we have a substantial database of information that are speaking about the lifestyle of the individuals. Lifestyle choices that are affecting life. It's not only smoking or drinking, it is the type of restaurants. If you are a, a fit guy, if you like sports, for example. Now, all of that, co combine it with uh, the super power of computers, the computing power that has been exponentially increased, now you can make and connect the dots. Some examples of tangible things that we have done connecting those things, right? There is a disease called lupus. That uh, it is an autoimmune disease, is affecting uh, uh, many people, it's a nasty disease. And uh, we have in our research pipeline a molecule that uh, can, uh, can uh, has signs of efficacy when we have severe flares, okay? As we want to move it to see if we can have really a product that can have lupus, we need to understand better the disease. And we don't know why this is effective only in severe flares. We partner with a company that has nothing to do normally, actually they are investing in that field now, it's called 23andMe. Okay, it's a company that what they are doing it is they are uh, having a business model that you can send your DNA, a sample of your saliva, and then they can tell you your ancestry, if you are Scottish or if you are, uh, they, they analyze your database, your DNA basically, and they have more than a million records. So we decided to run a clinical trial combining the DNA records of those people. They have to consent, so it's difficult to find them. We are going to choose 5,000 of them, and uh, we are going to understand, connect that with their lifestyle choices, trying to find how that uh, can affect uh, the lupus disease and our understanding, and if we can move this specific medicine into a specific group of uh, lupus disease patients that can be affected. Another uh, example is that uh, there were, uh, and this is a product that I'm going to mention, there is a small percentage of lung cancer patients that when you see their lifestyle, uh, is not incriminating for cancer disease. So, for example, they're not smokers, they are not coal minders, they are not living in polluted areas, they develop lung cancer in young ages. Analyzing the database and the genomics, we discovered that uh, they are developing cancer because they have a mutation in one of their genes. Okay, it's called ALK gene, and this is mutated. So the question was, how can we develop a medicine that uh, can alter this mutation, can affect that mutation, so those people will not uh, progress into their cancer when they develop the cancer? And uh, again, big data was extremely useful in trying to identify patterns of for those people that they have this genomics, uh, they have this mutation, and uh, understand how and what will be the molecules that could be effective. And eventually, this is a drug right now, that uh, it's not effective in everyone, right? But if you have this mutation, it's extremely effective. Right. Now, coming to uh, challenges of using that, there are multiple challenges. And um, privacy of data is an important one. And all the legal framework that comes with that, what happens if your, if your uh, research uh, had uh, issues with um, People that were not, uh, when it's not a clinical, of course, when it's a controlled clinical trial, always the people are giving their consent. But what it is, uh, not a, a controlled clinical trial, and you are using data that are stored 
unadated fight, uh, but still uh, data of uh, people that maybe didn't want to be part of a study like that. There is legal implications with uh, pharmacovigilance. Right now there is a very uh, strong uh, framework, legal framework, uh, that dictates uh, that every side effect of every medicine is to be reported. Uh, when I say every side effect of every medicine, there is me as a Pfizer employee, if I'm in a party and uh, you tell me that uh, a friend of you was taking one of our medicines and broke her leg because she fell, I need to report that within 24 hours. Right? It's a serious violation if, if I don't. Now imagine the amount of information that suddenly will <laughs> surface okay, if you are going into big data and uh, the ability of us <laughs> staying compliant within the legal framework and still uh, uh, utilizing all of this information for the benefit of the patient. Let me go to Nicole now to talk about that from the, the sort of UK government perspective, because I think that what we've started to do in this panel is kind of scope out the boundaries of the conversation. And I think, you know, I'd love for you to talk a little bit, Nicole, with us about the role of your office. The, you're the director of the Office for Life Sciences at the Department of Health and Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. How do you see um, the role of your, your institution coming into this discussion? But I know that you also are interested at looking the intersections that we've been talking about, particularly with the patient in mind. Um, can you give us some perspectives on your work and, and programs as it relates to this topic? Absolutely, and I was delighted that we started this session talking about health and wealth, because I think that data is really the underpinning of how we're going to um, drive forward a revolution in health and improve the efficiency of our industry. So um, I'd like to talk a bit about what the, the UK government is doing in setting out the infrastructure to use our data assets to, um, to get faster cures, which is the, the theme of, of this event. Um, obviously, we're very concerned about protecting data. Um, and as, uh, as Nicola reflected, there's a lot of work to do. And I think we should just sort of pause for thought on that before we talk about how we're going to use data that is critical that we get the right consent environment and the right protection for data before we talk about any of the other things that we want to do. Um, so we, are, we have a, a large number of assets in the UK um, around health data. So the NHS has a large number of very diverse patients and we have patient records in primary care and increasingly in secondary care that are, that are computerized. We have the 100,000 Genome Project, which integrated with the NHS is connecting genotypic and phenotypic information about 100,000 people. We have the Biobank, which has um, uh, more data, it has a birth cohort, and again is collecting an enormous amount of, of information. And then we bring together HSCIC and CPRD. At the end of this year, there'll be a data for research set, which is available to researchers to help plan clinical trials, but also to help think about how they're going to carry out real world evidence studies in future. So we are very focused on creating that infrastructure in the UK, which in future will allow us to improve health, but also generate investment in the UK to do trials and to, 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 uh, to use that UK infrastructure. The real world evidence collection that is enabled by the system will be a really important feature, we think, of how um, we can get products to patients more quickly. So through the accelerated access review, we are looking at how we could uh, consider um, conditional reimbursement by getting products to patients earlier um, and collecting that data out in the real world, not just in clinical trials. So could we develop a proposition where uh, Alberta's company, for example, or any other company could bring a product to us earlier and we can get that product to our patients and collect real evidence, but then use that evidence to determine what that product is really worth um, and then pay the right price for that product. So we think this would be a, a real revolution in using data to get products to patients earlier but create value for everybody, so really growing the pie. Take the cost out for companies as well and so grow wealth as well. So we think this is a really mutual win-win. So uh, we think also that data will be really important in the UK in developing a wide range of health industries. So there's not only the precision medicine and genomics industries mining that data, using that data, but also uh, health analytics 
and um, the development of a wide number of apps and digital health technologies. And we think the UK is a, going to be a great place for this environment because of this very rich data resource that we're working with consent to open up to researchers in the public and private sectors. And then finally, thinking about patients. So we're very focused, and you uh, may be familiar with uh, the Secretary of State and the Minister for Life Sciences, George Freeman's statements. By the way, he's very sorry not to be here today. I think he's on the front bench in the House this morning. So, um, but he's very, very supportive of this agenda. Um, so the Secretary of State and George Freeman have both spoken recently about um, getting a lot greater availability of all of us in the UK to our patient records, to be able to get it on our smartphones, not only to book our appointments, but to be able to access our patient records and to be able to integrate that with our, uh, with our own data that we collect through our apps and Fitbits and, and, uh, and other um, things that we have. And so we see a, a whole uh, ecosystem through the personal, uh, through the, what, what government provides and also working with industry as a, the uh, data is a, an important underpinning of this future environment in the UK that the government's seeking to create. Fantastic. So let me ask you, the, the um, topic was brought up about, you know, kind of this data revolution of everybody wearing a Fitbit, which I have, but I, I still sort of view it as kind of amusing that somehow this is going to change anything. Uh, can we talk a little bit about you know, the types of data, because the data that I'm getting of did I hit my 10,000 steps today or not um, seems insubstantial to, you know, the data that we're going to need to create more therapies for Parkinson's disease or new vaccines uh, to keep it safe so that we don't have government data breaches. How, I mean, let's do a little bit of future thinking right now. I'd like the panelists to be um, you know, kind of expanding our horizons a little bit. You know, is this going to actually be beneficial? And um, is there, are there restrictions? Is it all about creating the proper constructs so that we don't have uh, negative data breaches? Or are there so, still some missing links here? Who wants I to start? Give, I can give you an example. Yeah. You, you spoke about Parkinson. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are doing some work with uh, wearable spoons. Actually, you're not wearing them, but... Uh, you can detect early tremble of uh, someone who could be an early sign of Parkinson. Mm -hmm. We couldn't do that before, right? So with this early diagnosis, okay, you can have then try to build experiments or try to build clinical trials with compounds that you have in your, in your um, uh, pipeline that uh, can try to see if we can have higher efficacy signals in earlier stages of the disease. Mm -hmm. That's just mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. I think the point you bring up is, is really important, which is we talked about how big data can revolutionize patient care, and it really can. But we're also beginning to realize how little we know about what's normal. And the more information you collect, the more you realize that your constructs of normality have changed. One of the things we did with devices and with wearable devices is we had, um, we, Mayo Clinic has as part of its infrastructure a uh, retirement home that we look after. And we asked some of the individuals to our home if they would be willing to let their place where they live be totally outfitted and their devices be recorded. And we had our physicians, because um, that's where the data was coming back to, um, have real-time access to the data. And what we learned is that very quickly, we found very, very, very anxious physicians. We found that you know, an ectopic heartbeat followed by a second one and then a third one, and it was a new place to be. What do you do? Patients find, they just went and not the patient, they're, you know, they're just looking at the refrigerator. And so you quickly get into a point where the information that you just talked about from the Fitbit, from all our wearable devices, from all other things, have to be integrated. And so the premise is that we have to move from large data, which is just a lot of data, to big data, where it is a variety of data that is brought into the context of the patient or the consumer. It is doable, but what we'll need is a paradigm shift in one who controls that information, and two, who is going to sift through that information? What smart algorithms are we going to have to do, provide to make sure that the information is used in a way that doesn't interfere with somebody's life, but rather augment somebody's life? And fundamentally, that is going to be a decision that has to be made 
not only at the level of a person, but at the level of a group of people that includes a family. Because often we're now seeing relatives, children who live very far away from their elderly parent that feel it is their right to know what's happening to that elderly parent, but the elderly parent is saying, no, I don't want you to know what time I get out of bed. That's me. <laughs> and, and that is what we will have to deal with as we move forward with our big data solutions. I think the key thing is the linkage of data. So as you say, a Fitbit, just number of steps, that on its own isn't particularly useful information. It's when you combine it together with other sets of information about you that you begin to find useful information. So take a drug for obesity, for example, you may find that it's much more effective if somebody is exercising more, or it's only effective in certain populations and for smokers it's not effective. So it's when you put together different sets of information that you begin to get the value. There are risks at the same time. The more linkage, linkage you do, the greater the likelihood of re-identification of an individual, and one has to be aware of that. The other real challenge is the point you raised before about the quality of the data. Real-world data is messy, and we don't yet know how to get the best value from it. There's a lot of questions about the way it was collected, how you... It, it's very different from the way you would collect data in a pure research setting, and we need to get better at mining it and understanding those differences. But I think we did hear a little bit about, uh, you, you mentioned earlier the velocity of data, and I think that's the thing that is striking me about this conversation and this point in history of you know, biomedical research is that it, you know, we're sort of awash in data, and I, I like the way you just frame that, which is kind of, can we create it into more of a 360 view so that it's not just an event that actually didn't impact the patient at that point, they just were looking in the refrigerator. Um, Mary, do you have any perspectives on this from a more of a patient-centric view? I mean, how do you see the future kind of playing out in terms of the, the appropriate dosing, if you will, of the needs of patient privacy with the possibilities of, of what you know, all of this could mean? If I could make just some comments yeah. and then a plea. So uh, I know you're going to do it very politely, so I, I'm happy to have you do that. <laughs> no, you, you asked about wearing these gimbos. Yeah. And all. Well, they've done some quick research at DG Connect, and they're prophesying that in the future, these apps are going to have more effect mm -hmm. on patients' health than the healthcare professionals. And they've got some really interesting evidence. They ran a trial on um, blood pressure, where they had 70 people come and have a lecture from the doctor uh, about what, what, what they'd got to do and, and how they'd got to use their app. And the other 70 had the lecture as well and had regular appointments with GPs. But the 70 on the apps at the end of 10 months had better blood pressures. So, I mean, there's, there's that we've already got up. The Human Brain Project, which is one of the biggest projects in Europe, um, is collecting data and, and particularly getting it from the NHS and there were lots of reservations about it. It was going to be, you know, this was going to be risky. NHS, uh, the stuff pouring into the Human Brain Project has been delightfully received, everything well protected, all running smoothly. And when you look across Europe, there are pockets where ageing is not as good as other places, where there's more dementias. And I mean, I as a sociologist love this because this is real epidemiology. Then we come to the personalised medicine and that was the big push by the presidency of Luxembourg. They really pushed this. And I think you first of all have to define what we mean because there's a few P's about this. So really what, what, how it was defined was that it was personalised, it could predict, it could prevent, but it must be participatory. We then had wonderful presentations, but I would suggest that to the man in the street, Mr. and Mrs. Smith out there, know absolutely nothing about this, except through Angelina Jolie. Here is a woman who came forward and with a double mastectomy and a double oophorectomy has now made it very clear. But I suspect our society thinks, well, this is just for the rich and the famous. So my plea is that with all your knowledge, and I mean, I know I'm sitting here with great knowledge on the platform here, your communication is still far from perfect. 
the, the, the society does not understand a lot of the things in the yeah. previous meeting. And I, I love listening. And I feel privileged to listen to all of this and your, your work at Pfizer. But society doesn't know. And you've got to get it into all of your heads that society is bigger than all of you. Mm -hmm. I remember what happened to Galileo. They're bigger, they're more powerful. Or if you're British, remember what the Luddites did to the Industrial Revolution. You must take society with you. And I don't know how we're going to do that. That's a bit of a challenge. Well, do you think you raised in the beginning of your comments around, um, I, I appreciated that anecdote of people paying more attention to an app or a wearable than their physician. And I think that I don't want to discount the role of physicians if, if they're in the room or listening to this panel, um, because it sort of needs a little bit from everyone. We need to figure out what's the layering. But do you think that the, some of the technology offers up some hope of um, that communication breakdown that you're describing? I think it will. And I have to say, of course, to me as an old person, I much prefer to relate to a healthcare professional. But that's my age. That's what I like. I like to come up with the questions. But um, I'm sure for the generation, uh, my children and my grandchildren undoubtedly are going to use the apps. This is, this is a new way forward. And I think um, I heard um, a gentleman speak at, at a meeting, which I have never forgotten. And he was asked about the challenges for health going ahead. And he said, so I've never forgotten it. He said, but you've got to remember that mankind is basically Paleolithic. Our institutions are basically medieval, but communication now is space age. And it's how we're going to get all that together. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a real challenge because you know there's undoubtedly um, tremendous steps forward. But the actual getting the knowledge to the people who really need that is, I still think, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Thoughts from the panelists on this? How do we take this uh, topic, which admittedly is big and a little bit lumbering, and, and bring it to the masses? And it, I mean, it, these points are very relevant to science funding You know, in any different nation, that if people don't uh, understand the relevancy, then they're not going to no, they you know, ask for it to happen. I often say in the States that I think that there's a sense of, um, you know, amongst the general population not wanting to be stupid or science illiterate, you know, sort of not wanting to raise their hand and say, I didn't really like biology, I didn't, I didn't take physics, um, I didn't take a computer class, that kind of thing. I used a typewriter um, and I used to get my hand slapped when I made the mistakes, which is literally how, you know, I, even in my generation, that's, that's how I learned to, to use a computer. So how are we going to manage this? And are you doing anything in your work uh, with your um, initiative? Well, I think one of the things that um, technology allows us to think about is promoting health rather than talking about sickness. Mm -hmm. So people don't really like a box in the corner of their living room that reminds them that they're ill. But actually, because people now, um, as you say, the younger generations in particular, are more used to using their phone, if, if we can create apps in a way that helps them think about promoting wellness, and continuing to be well and treating themselves and taking ownership of disease, that could be one way into getting much greater buy-in. So I think that there will be segments of society who are harder to access, but uh, there are some diseases that actually using apps and digital technologies, so for example in mental health, well people might find it easier to talk online than it is to talk face to face with a professional or to interact in a more anonymous fashion. Um, so I think that there are, there are opportunities. There are some really good apps as well where um, you can use symptom trackers and that engage people more in making their own decisions about health and if they change their medication from the morning to the evening, how that would affect and they can track how that's doing it. So I think, I think technology allows us to draw people in in a way that talks about wellness rather than about sickness. Albert, how do you do that at a company like Pfizer? It's basically we're talking about bringing the future to the present because the present uh, is dictated by the constructs that you reference, that you still have to have this data package to be able to take to the regulatory authorities to get your approval and then prove your outcomes to the payers and that kind of thing. But we're actually talking a little bit futuristic um, around, you know, kind of how are we going to do this in, you know, in years ahead. So how at a company like Pfizer do you marry those two concepts? We, we try to evolve and uh, we're not the only ones. I think uh, regulator, regulators are trying to evolve. FDA is trying to evolve. I had the uh, uh, privilege to, to meet with, uh, 
with George Freeman uh, yesterday, and I saw his vision about evolving, let's say, UK into life sciences. Uh, in, uh, I think Mary made some thought-provoking comments that uh, they sounded music to my ears, because I think she's, she's right. We, we need to take society with us. We need to convince society that there is value in medical research, and uh, there are diseases that uh, can, incurable diseases, that uh, we can uh, change them, right? And um, we are living in, in, a, in an era that uh, was never better time to do that, because there is a huge movement of wellness around. People want to live healthier lives. They want to, to, to eat healthy. They want to exercise. And also consumers, they have enormous power due to the internet revolution. And as a result, they want to take the health in their hands. So there is a lot of self-care movement. Okay? The question is how you utilize this sensitivity to educate people about what needs to be done, not only in terms of research, but also in terms of uh, changing the framework, the regulatory and legislative framework that is needed so to move to the next era. Yeah. And, and do you see that in the health systems, that you, you know, in, in Mayo's work? We have, I think, as a group in, in healthcare, have always underestimated the public's not only appetite for knowledge, but the need to have control of that knowledge. So when we started in our personalized initiative uh, uh, at Mayo Clinic, we embedded bioethicists very early into the process. And they were very careful about what to do with, the, with genomic information. We've now heard back really loudly from consumers and patients. And that what they've told us is they want to be the only people that decide where the limit of the information is. They want to decide what they want and what do not want to know. And we're seeing this ripple down now into every other aspect of what we're doing. We spent numerous, numerous months debating whether to release all information that from, from our patients to the patients to a portal before they actually met with the provider. And you can just imagine the pros and the cons of knowing a result on Friday when you seeing somebody on Monday. After, when we did that, it turned out there was hardly a ripple. Patients were accepting that they would actually much rather know and know early and then deal with it on their own. I actually think that consumers are way more educated and way more knowledgeable about things than sometimes the provider themselves. And actually, I would actually flip it and say that we are at a point now where we actually have to educate the provider about big data. We have to educate the provider about individualized medicine because the person that is sitting in front of the provider very much, very often has even more information than the provider themselves. And we shouldn't forget how recent this change is and that most providers were post-medical school when all this information has come out, when the alt drug has come out, when, when all the rare disease um, genomic initiatives have come out. So, it is not simply educating people. It's actually listening to people and actually educating the provider. Well, and it's, it's really creating a collaborative, right? So it's, it's not saying to the healthcare provider, we expect you to be God and you can never uh, admit wrong, a yeah. failing yeah. or a lack of knowledge or data. Um, you know, a personal friend of mine who is in treatment for breast cancer, and it, it's a tough diagnosis, uh, her provider, I ratcheted up in my eyes when the provider said, we've reached the limits of the treatment that we have to offer you. You need to now pursue uh, clinical trials. And she's in a uh, stand up to cancer trial that she's responding really well to. Uh, but it took her provider, you know, kind of owning that and saying, I need to you know, pass you on. And there's, there's the next part of the system that, that's kind of ready. Um, so Mary, you were going to jump in on this topic. Well, yes, because um, I, I notice I'm, I'm sort of here as the patients, but actually we must talk about society because you won't get off this planet without being a patient, so you might as well get into the conversation now. It, we're all part of society, and I think if we are going to talk about prevention and try to do as much as we can for that, we have to get into the education system. We have to talk to the schools. 
And, and that's what we're really trying to, because we have got a lot of people who are sleepwalking towards illnesses that we could really divert them from, that they don't have to go there, but they are sleepwalking. And I think we've got a, we have to go really right up the river now. It's not just about when they appear in the doctor's surgery. There's a long pathway to that surgery, and we should be getting out there. Well, I think there's amazing potential there. Um, so I am privileged to be in an acting role. In addition to running Faster Cures, I'm the acting CEO and president for a group called the Melanoma Research Alliance. And they are the largest private funder in the United States of melanoma science. We've seen some breathtaking change. We just heard a presentation um, two weeks ago at Johns Hopkins uh, by a you know, majestic cancer researcher who was basically showing some of the, the biological changes that happened 10 years prior to having a melanoma. And it's a very, you know, there's complexity here, but I was sitting in that room thinking, you know, that might change uh, if, if a smoker had some sort of indicator of what was happening biologically, that it, they weren't gonna have to pay the price 40 years later, their, their body was already starting to pay the price. And the same thing with melanoma. Um, I also wanna go back to another point that was raised around um, sort of this shifting role of the healthcare provider. I encourage you to go on the fastercures.org website. We did a very brief patient-oriented video. It's about a four-minute video with a graphic um, facilitator. So it's, it's showing the journey of where we've been and where we are. And I, every time I see it, I'm struck by the fact that I think it was 1975 um, that a patient was legally allowed to be told their diagnosis that prior to that, the, the physician or provider really didn't have to say, you have cancer, you have this, you have that. And so it's, it, again, I'm not trying to put the provider in the, in the bad box. I think that we are, you know, as you say, Mary, we're all in this together and we're kind of living through it. Um, so in our final minutes, I'd love to do a quick lightning round with our panelists and have you, um, you know, give us maybe one or two items that you think we really need to start to tackle, whether it's, from your perspective here in the UK, or it's something internationally, and you know, what what do you think is going to make a difference? What do you think we need to be paying attention to? And we'll we'll just start at the end. I think that point about engaging healthcare professionals is key. We've had conversations where we've had patients in the room and GPs in the room at the same time. The patients have assumed that their data is already being shared and used in this way and have been very surprised to hear it isn't. GPs, on the other hand, have been saying, oh, but you wouldn't want that and if you knew what we knew. And, and I think there needs to be much, much better communication about the benefits of sharing this data, why we want to use it, both to the patients, but also particularly to the healthcare professionals. So that's my plea. Yeah. I think we, need, we have a lot to learn from other places like the financial system where a common infrastructure is present to be able to effortlessly move data in, in, in milliseconds. So the first would be that let, we do need to broaden up what we're doing to make sure that our infrastructure works. And the second, and really to me is essential, is that we need to start bringing in very diverse data sets if we're going to make big data really change the way our lives are led. And in order to do so, we have to open up and begin to incorporate into these very narrow patient encounters a lot of synthesis that has to happen before that encounter takes place. For me, I would want to focus on the patient outcomes. That is what matters. It's, it's, and please, this is not about patient empowerment. This just makes the sense. If you're something, if an intervention is expensive, and we know they are, then you should look at the real outcome. If you can get somebody back to work and they're now paying their taxes and not receiving benefits, that medicine, that intervention is not expensive. It was a darn good investment. And much more on that the health of the nation is a wealthy nation. Well, and that was a very, I think, prominent theme in our last discussion about precision medicine is the role of health economics. And I think that we, we're looking at it in, in a little bit of a um, two-dimensional way currently. It needs to be broadened out. Um, you know, Mike Milken would talk about the impact of um, a child having a relationship with a grandparent for a long period of time and what are the long-term impacts on that child to have 
the knowledge transfer of that kind of relationship. So even, you know, the points you raised of somebody going to work is powerful and important, but it's also just, it's not just nice to know, but, you know, really there is knowledge transfer. And I think the big challenge now is the people coming together, big pharma mm -hmm. and the, the, the patient groups, the clinicians, the regulators, we have to get a measurement on that. Yeah. You can't just say, right. I feel better, I'm back at work. Here is your economic measurement. This shows that the investment in that I I I procedure has paid off. Absolutely. I, I just want to, 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 to finish with what I started, but we are at the beginning. We are scratching the surface. I think yeah. the opportunities are enormous. I think the, the data are there. I think the computing power is there. And the big data will affect every single aspect of health. Uh, the way that uh, uh, drug development is evolving the way that health is administered, and the way that people are living healthier lives. Uh, there will be obstacles. Uh, data are sensitive, and as a result, there is a tendency to protect them. We had the European Court decision that is not allowing now data from Europe to move to, to US. That's an obstacle. Needs to be addressed, in a way. But I'm very optimistic. Uh, for me, I think the key opportunity is collaboration in the use of data. So. Uh, industry, collaborating with governments, collaborating with charities and researchers, how we can really make the most of the data that we have available to us to best get cures for, for those diseases or, or you know, to treatments for those diseases that uh, we hope that we, we and our families won't, won't get. So I want to thank our panelists. I can tell you I've moderated a few of these panels before. And in you know, the days of old, we would have spent our entire time uh, with our head in our hands, you know, furrowing our brow about this isn't going to work, that's not going to work, you're wrong, I'm right, <laughs> and we're way past that now. And I think that you could tell in this conversation that we're really kind of catapulting as fast forward as we possibly can. Um, I can guarantee you if we have this discussion in a year's time, um, we will see some sort of breathtaking progress in this. But I want to harken back to what Mary um, reminded us, which is we need to be bringing in everyone into this conversation. It's not just the people in this room. Um, and also just the reminder that the solutions that you may have from your particular vantage points are relevant, uh, that we all will be patients at some point. And I think the long-term goal for all of us is to spread that, um, you know, the, the treatments, cures, interventions, uh, all of the prevention opportunities as widely as possible, um, well beyond this room, um, this continent, and, and all of us. So thank you all very much. Um, please do stay in touch with us at fastercures.org. There's a couple of different newsletters that you can sign up for to kind of get a lot of the content that we're working on on a daily basis. Thank you all very much, and thank you, panelists. Appreciate it. Thank you.